gosh, I've, I've been with Stellar for 15 years, and I probably did awareness training, hosted it for about 12 years, and it started out very nice, where I could talk to users, we'd have exchanges and share ideas, I'd hear what was wrong, and I would tell them what I wanted them to do and, and understand the, the struggle. And it worked out nice, but over time, it just got bloated, inflated, and again, uh, 50 slides over two hours. So last year I went to the summit, and I learned a lot. I, I learned about some, you know, different people doing escape rooms, and, and we wanted to try that. So that was in August, this week in, in August last year, and by September 1st, we were rolling out our escape room. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I got with Justin, he's a, a big gamer, as you've seen. Right. So for those who don't know what an escape room is, uh, it's for ours, it can be any amount of time, but ours was a 60-minute real-life adventure. I know it's called an escape room. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to get out of the room. You can have it start and end with any objective. If we just wanted everyone to get out of the room as quick as possible, we would have stuck with the two-hour PowerPoint slides. <laughs> uh, so you can theme the room any way you want. We just did like a security workstation theme. Uh, basically, it's just a matter of starting with one objective, finding hidden clues, solving puzzles, and sequentially getting from beginning to end with a beginning goal and an end goal. Uh, it requires a lot of teamwork, speed, creativity, there's a lot of conversation, good team building. All right, so where to start? Where are the instructional designers in here? Anyone? Yeah, what do you start with? Your objectives, right? We, I, I see a lot of people try to do this exercise and they, they start with the puzzles. Uh, we want to define what we want to get done, what, what, what do we want our users to understand? So we want to define those objectives. Um, we want to make it relatable to all groups. You know, that was our, another challenge. And then we wanted to make, we wanted to build teams that build teams. All right, meaning we have technical people, we have accounting and finance people. That's what makes up the bulk of our organization. We wanted them to work together. And so this was a byproduct. This is how one of the milestones getting it through, through management was showing that we can get these people to work together. Um, force them to, to go have fun together. And it, it really worked out well. So our start objective for our teams was, first off, everyone had been assigned to the information security team. Now this took a lot of time because there was a lot of everyone getting out their phones, calling their friends, their families, estranged fathers and saying, I finally made it, it's fine, go ahead, buy that boat, uh, I'm on the security team now. Um, sadly, on this first day of their job, though, one credit card record had been compromised, had been found out, um, and it was, it was up to their team to find this credit card capture information and report it to the security team properly. So there was a couple of rules, and again, we put all of this in the handouts. Literally, you can just print out the handouts, just change the words, change the names, just mad libs it, and you'll be fine. Uh, so Game Master is always right. The Game Master was Bob and I. We would oversee all the games. They had a 60-minute time limit, and you're going to see we were able to just go on Google and just put in a countdown clock for 60 minutes. Um, all the information associated with the game was classified, which we actually were more worried about having a problem with that and never did. Right. Like, people got so competitive, they would not give away Nobody any of the puzzle hints anything, or yeah. clues or anything. They left tight-lipped. They wouldn't say anything. Um, all policies and procedures, as far as the company is concerned, had to be followed, uh, and there were physical items in the room. This was a physical security room. They could not take those items and leave the room with them for any reason, and once again, just to reiterate, the game master, Bob and I, both in the game and generally in life, were always <laughs> right. So up to this point, it sounds very complicated, and you're thinking, well, I'll never get a room, and I'll never be able to secure an area. Um, actually, go ahead with the penalties real quick. Oh, we also had some penalties. Um, because it was based on time of that 60 minute time, their score is based on how much time they had remaining when they got out of the room. All the teams were able to finish within 60 minutes, but there were some penalties. So I had some hints available. If they asked for a hint, it was a five minute penalty. If they failed any of the security policies that were mentioned earlier and mentioned in the rules, that was also a five minute penalty. And breaking any of the general rules was a five minute penalty that would be added to their total time at the end. So it's this simple. It's, uh, we, we didn't have to get a, an area and reserve it for a month. Uh, we, we were able to go to multiple conference rooms when, whenever they were available. We had two cardboard partitions. We had two laptops that were retired. IT gave them to us. We have instructions on how to set up the account in the handout, so just follow those. Uh, we got a little box on Amazon, and then we have some door handles that our physical security people gave us. This is nice. It all fit into one box. If we wanted to move this to another conference room, mm -hmm. it took us five minutes to do it. If we wanted to ship this to our office in Austin, it took a day to get there. 
So it's, and it's cheap enough. It was all cost $105, I think, to do the setup. So you can do this in multiple locations. All right, so objective one, uh, demonstrate passwords can easily be guessed or cracked. They can, and we always hear this, right? We always tell users, well, they can be, you know, passwords are bad, you gotta make them strong, you gotta make them hard to guess. So in the one cube, we set up this. So let's start, help me out. What's the username? Anybody guess what the username is? All right, so actually, so username, it's the, the user is Andy Ware, right? So the, the, the username is probably A Ware. Right? And then and you're going down the path for the password already? Yep. So what were, the, what were the suggestions on the password? I swear I heard it already. There yeah. you go. Princess, Princess Lila 2018 exclamation point. We even had some go in the dark ink that when they turned out the lights would go under, an UV, under a UV light that they could get to. And um, take no notice to the colorful little Lego house that's completely non-consequential. Yeah, pay no attention to it yep, right pay now. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. So um, with, the, with the, the laptops, they were set to lock out after three attempts for one minute. And again, those are in the instructions, uh, but very easy to do. We encourage people to use the board mm -hmm. and to communicate, all right? So they, they would talk as a team. Uh, but using the board, anytime, anybody that works in an incident, you know you have to use the board. So we were, we were trying to get them to, to get that happen. Yeah, the most successful well. teams were the ones that were writing down all the attempts that they made so they didn't go back and try them over again so that they could convey to the person who was sitting at the keyboard typing quickly which ones they wanted to try. Those were the teams that got it the fastest. So our second objective, identify improperly stored PII. Uh, that's uh, personally identifiable information. All right, now we do a pretty good job of this at our company. However, we often get data that people don't expect PII to be in. Uh, so we wanted to demonstrate that. So um, this is where it gets interesting. This is where you have to make it yours, all right? We do a lot of bank reconciliations for our clients, and our project managers and account managers, they can do those in a heartbeat. Our technical people have no idea what they're looking at. So in this case, we had a transaction ID and a bank reconciliation that was bad, and if you talk to your accounting people, they'll just say, oh yeah, we can do that for you. They can come up with some sample file for that. And then um, once they got there, uh, the transaction ID was uh, papers printed out on the desk. So PII left out in this case. And if you look there, it's uh, transaction ID 33089. And if you look all the way to the right, you see we crossed out the, the first set, but the last four is 5589. That's someone's social security number. So what we see often in our organization is tax IDs, EINs, federal tax IDs for vendors. And when our clients have a a vendor that is, say if I were consulting with them, I don't have an EIN, but I would give them my social security number. So now that document that typically wouldn't have anything, any PII in there now does. So that happens a lot to our clients and we want our employees to understand that and watch out for it. Um, so they came up with the number 5589 and again, mark it on the board. So objective three, uh, level of protection should be proportionate to what we're protecting. And again, we, we see we have a lot of secrets. Uh, we have keys to different things and uh, passwords and passcodes and uh, whatever the data is. We want to make sure that we're, we're protecting it with the right, the right locks. So uh, this, this was our little box that we bought on Amazon for like $10. So you can see it seems like it should be protected. It's got a combination lock on it. But you can also just easily take the screws right off the hatch. You could just throw this thing on the ground and step on it and break it open. So what he's saying is, you, you, the security on the item needs to match what is inside. And you're gonna see what's inside is really important here. So they would use that 5589 on the combination, be able to open the lock, and there'd be these instructions in here. So they were given one badge per player, minus one. So there was always one less badge than the number of total people, and you'll see why that matters. Uh, they were also given door access badges, and these did actually work on the doorknobs that were at the end of the table. We actually had them programmed. We didn't have to stand there and just beep and let them know. <laughs> <laughs> so they but would be able you can to do that. Yeah, you can certainly do that if you want. Yeah, you could certainly do that, but we actually had them programmed and they were able to go through from one room to the other. Um, this also let us know if people were going to try to tailgate, if they would just wander through the room. And we actually had nobody tailgate. We, we have broken them of that. They are, they are husks of people That's now right. as far as tailgating goes. So, so that brings us to objective four, demonstrate compliance with physical access controls, or access control policies and procedures. And again, we, uh, you all have the no tailgating rule, and uh, you watch for it. But in this case, we had five participants playing, four cards. Uh, there was, so there was always one person without mm -hmm. a card, meaning somebody had to stay back. 
Uh, and, and again, they honored us, um, mm -hmm. mainly because we were watching and uh, they were warned, <laughs> no. but uh, we thought for sure somebody would have passed a card back or, or tried or, or just went through it. But uh, again, if you're, your physical security people have these laying around, if not, just use a box of tissues and a card and, and you know, just tell people if you have a card you can go through, if you don't, you don't. So make it up as you go along. Let's make it clear, we're always watching. Exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, recognize the risk of password reuse. Uh, if, you were, if you were in the, the OSINT, um, in Micah's class earlier, uh, he talked about password reuse, and that was one of the things where we look for uh, passwords that have been used other places and try them in other places. Uh, so users, they, we have to drill this home to, to them that this happens a lot. So anytime there's a breach, a password compromise, or some database out there gets compromised, and it has all the password hashes in it, um, it's likely those users, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, but think, is your Gmail the same as your Citibank account? You know, the same password, or your work account? Is that the same as your Chase you know, credit card, or, or your mortgage company, or anything like that? So we wanna make sure that we always use different, different passwords for our different accounts. Um, and this goes for the bad guys, too. So one of the, the biggest card, uh, carters, they're called, uh, the people that sell cards online, they, they steal cards and then they sell them. So he was from Russia. Uh, the ended up, he went into some territory where uh, our Secret Service and FBI were able to get him. They brought him in. They couldn't, FBI and the Secret Service couldn't get into the, the servers that he was selling all this on. And he ended up, they, they got into his email though. And on his email, they had an email from the Russian equivalent of Fandango. And on there, it said, welcome to whatever the name was and it had the username, here's your account, your username is this, and your password is this. And uh, sure enough, to get into the cloud services that he was selling all the cards on was the same password. So it, it's, yeah, nobody's, nobody's uh, protected from that one. So they take a look at this laptop, there's no information provided to them, but they would immediately know, hey, we've already got a username, we've already got a password, they would try it and be able to log into this laptop. And this is the laptop in the other room. They would, as soon as they logged in, they would get this big obvious 10 on the screen, and the important thing about this is they would put this on the whiteboard and be able to use it for later, and you'll see why. All right, then our favorite, uh, phishing. Identify phishing attempt email. So we, we do our, our monthly phishing attempts, and, and our users are awesome. We have uh, less than 1% click rate. Um, so they, and the reporting, I wish it were a little better, but they're, they're pretty good. Uh, so we printed out a bunch of different emails, put it up on the other cubicle wall, and um, if you look on the tops, you see we've put colors. So the colors mean something. And we asked them to write those colors on the board and then cross out the ones that were real emails. All right, so anything legit, they would cross out. So they were ended up with green, black, gray, and blue. So any guess on where, the colors where came those from. colors come from? It, within the room. The house. Thank you, there we go, right? <laughs> wow, they actually so, listen to me. <laughs> right, but their cards don't work to get back to the other side, correct? So they scan to get on the other side of the room, but they can't get back, but there's still one person left on the other side of the room. Mm -hmm. So that was the intent of leaving that person. So they were angry uh, that they were left behind and everybody's scrambling on the other side, mm -hmm. trying to figure out what these colors mean and they're looking at the house. And uh, so they come up with a solution. Yep, and they'd come up with to be able to associate the colors from the emails with the green being the Y, black being P, gray being E, and blue being B. All right, uh, then we wanted them to perform a manual cipher decryption, which sounds very hard because we talk about encryption all the time. And how many of you do your own encryption by hand? Yeah. Right? <laughs> it, it sounds, it's very mathematical, it's complex, right? But the concept itself isn't, and we want, it on, we want it users to understand that um, it isn't complex, you know, it, it's only the math that is complex, but um, by using a weak cipher, uh, we wanted to show how easy it is to, to get around that as well. So they had this cipher that came out of the box along with the room badges. They would be able to figure out that they had that offset of 10 that was on the desktop of the laptop that they logged into. Then they would have these colors that would now associate those letters read from outside to inside using that offset of 10. So green became, uh, green Y became O, Black P became F, gray E became U, and blue B became R. They would rearrange the letters. Somebody would always figure out that the, it spelled out four. Yep, so. And the important thing is, none of this is going on just one thing at a time. 
pretty much every time somebody was in one of these cubicle rooms, it was like Walmart Black Friday. They're ripping all the books out, they're tearing pages out, they're throwing yep. stuff on the floor. <laughs> I, no, nothing was safe. Uh, there may be some uh, replacement components you have to do. Um, but one of these books was a dictionary, and when you opened it, it actually had a combination lock in it. Uh, and then when they used the four to open the combination lock, they also got a password to a 7-zip uh, encrypted file that was on the desktop of the notebook. All right, so we wanted them to perform a file decryption using 7-zip. 7-zip um, is, if, you, if you've never used it, it's easy, it's free, and it's good for home users. So we, we wanted them to get some habits where, where they can do things at home as well. And we usually have them do this, and a lot of our, our employees like it because um, they come in telling us stories all the time, like, we're getting a mortgage, and they wanted me to email this, and it's like I said no, and, you know, so I put it into 7-zip, and they had to tell their broker how to, how to use 7-zip. And uh, so they're, they're proud of themselves. So this is a, a good thing, a good habit that they've, they've picked up with their own personal data, and they're, they're kind of spreading the word for us. So in this case, we had a file on the desktop called hash7z, and uh, they put in that password, and they were under, able to decrypt it, and now it's just hash.doc. Which brings us to objective nine. Um, crack a hash. So how many of you have cracked password hashes before, right? It's, it's not that hard, right? But it, it's even easier than that. So it's, we can use uh, John the Ripper and, and different tools, and even if you don't have to know Linux, you just have to know how to use a web browser in, in many cases. So we were able to give them access to the web browser. They had access to crackstation.net. Um, the important thing was get the hash, uh, crack the hash, use the hash. They entered the hashes they had into this box here, proved that they weren't a robot, however they went about doing that, even if they were robots. And then they were able to uh, have these passwords that came out of the hashes, and there was an associated email account with those. And again, that goes back into password reuse. So, so then once they had the password to the email account, they would just reopen the browser, go to Gmail, open up uh, the inbox on the Gmail account that they now had access to, and right there, lo and behold, was a credit card capture information, uh, which had you know, obviously fake credit card information in it, but they were all able to quickly recognize it. And then the next part is, did they know exactly what to do with it properly? All right. So again, it's one thing to identify and report something, but it's, we want them to report it, you know, appropriately and, and securely. And you know, the, we we want users to understand when you report an incident, if you're sending artifacts to us insecurely, you're just broadening the scope of the breach. Um, so we we often prefer they don't send anything, uh, but in this case, we, you know, we we're telling them to send this to us, and uh, you know, we wanted wanted them to do it securely. So they could take that credit card capture information, which was from legobrewing.com, which we're going we're gonna to get that domain name, right? We are. Okay. We are. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, from legobrewing.com, and they would put it into, a, say, a notepad file. They would, put it, they would uh, uh, encrypt it with 7-zip with a good password that met our security policies, and then send it off to another email address that we had set up for them to report the credit card capture information. And once we got that in the other email account, we would confirm it, that would end the game, that would stop the clock, and then that would be their score um, based on that and any of these other bonuses. So if you may have noticed, we had a couple of not really bonuses just to test people. We had a USB drive left on the table, and if they plugged that into the notebook, that was an immediate 10 minute penalty because we all know you cannot just plug in a random hard drive you find and just expect it to have all the answers. Yeah, we had two teams do it, and they lost because they did it. Yep. It was one loss because they, they had the penalty. A lot of tears. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and again, if they, sent, if they just immediately got excited and just forwarded that credit card capture information in plain text right onto the email address without taking it, encrypting it, and sending it to us, that was another 10 minute penalty. Uh, we did have some failures, uh, and you know, we just want to share them because we don't want you to make the same mistakes. Uh, we have a lot of remote users that we tried to include. Uh, I know that is the case for a lot of people, so what we did is we set up a, a, a team session on an iPad and had them use the webcam and the voice and everything on the iPad. Uh, the only issue is we had somebody holding the iPad on the team, but again, that person's going through books and half the time the remote user would just see the ceiling, the desk, that person's stomach. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times they would put that person face down on the desk while they're doing something and that person would be yelling the right answer. We had a remote user going, four, four, put the password in as four. But it just came out as <laughs> in the desk because nobody was listening. And we'd have to say, why don't you listen to your remote person? So they, they have the ability to be very engaged and very useful. It's just something you have to watch out for. 
a couple of times we had Windows updates run on the notebooks because they were very old and we would have to sit there and wait for those. If, if they forgot to log out of the Gmail account, the next team would immediately be able to log in. Same for the decryption of the file. Um, if we forgot to empty the recycle bin, they immediately had the hash file. Yep. And if we forgot to lock the book safe, and originally we had thought, oh, we should do prizes, but we didn't really have time for that, and it kind of turned out they were so competitive, it really didn't matter. Yeah. Bragging rights they kind were of worked. Just, it was, and, and again, these were combined teams, different departments, people that would not talk to each other unless there was a trouble ticket issued. Um, so it was good to, to get them all together and, and kind of rally against each other. All right, so from here, make it your own. You know, um, if, if you want to do this, go ahead and, and define your objectives. Make sure you define those objectives, what you want to measure first. Uh, then define your teams. If you have the opportunity to blend teams, go ahead and, and go for it. Uh, give your objectives to your management. Uh, if you walk into your management and say, hey, we want to do an escape room, uh, they're just going to tell you to get out of here and go play a game somewhere else. Uh, go in with a plan. Again, if you go in with the objectives, how you're going to measure it, uh, have your reward, your budget, all that stuff squared up. Um, and then if you do this, let us know how it went. You know, by all means, reach out to us. And if you have problems, if you have questions, if you have ideas, uh, reach out to us, and, and we'll gladly help you out. Please, by all means, just reach out to us. All right? Thank you. Thank you.